Okay, so I'm going to begin. Um, hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us for this panel discussion on race and migration. Uh, it's the first event in a new series that we're running at Autograph around rights and um, rights in light of COVID-19. Uh, you can find further information about our other events through our website uh, with the next event focusing on disability justice. Uh, my name is Livy and I manage the learning and participation program at Autograph, which is a public gallery in Shoreditch, London, where we explore issues of identity, representation, human rights and social justice through photography and lens based media. Uh, I'm very excited to be hosting this event tonight and to be joined by our two guest speakers, uh, Jabir Butt and Colin Yeo. Over the course of tonight's conversation, we'll be considering the role that structural racism plays in the experience of the pandemic, health inequality, and the impact of coronavirus on the UK's immigration system, on migrant, migrants and their families. Um, I should also mention we have BSL interpretation being provided throughout the night by Ali Gordon. Um, Ali, if you are interested in pinning Ali uh, to get a clearer view, you can do that. Uh, there are also some options to address the screen to suit your viewing needs. Um, so please do feel free to flick around with your settings and make that work for you. We are inviting questions from the audience throughout the event uh, for the Q&A section and that will follow the panel discussion and you can submit a question using the Q&A feature on the webinar and you can choose to submit your question either anonymously, in which case I will ask your question to the speakers or um, you can choose to submit your name, your question with your name, in which case I will invite you to put your question to our panelists directly by enabling your microphone with your permission. Um, tonight's event is, uh, is supported with funding from Arts Council England and the Esme Fairbound, Fairbound Foundation, which we're of course very grateful for. Uh, so without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists for tonight. Uh, so speaking first, we have Jabir Butt, Jabir, would you like to just give a wave? <laughs> uh, Jabir is the Chief Executive of Race Equality Foundation, where he has gained an international reputation for the use of evidence and developing interventions that help overcome discrimination and disadvantage. Jabir leads the Foundation's work around health and housing, as well as parenting and community initiatives. He also see, oversees the Foundation's role in the Health and Wellbeing Alliance, uh, which has seen the Foundation facilitate better conversations between the Black and minority ethnic-led voluntary sector and the Department of Health, NHS England and Public Health England, to better ensure that consideration for race equality and equality as a whole guide the transformation of health and social care. Uh, in 2013, he received an OBE for his work promoting race equality. <laughs> Uh, and then following Jabir, we'll have a presentation from Colin Yeo. Colin, do you want to give a wave? <laughs> Hello. Uh, Colin is a specialist immigration barrister at Garden Court Chambers in London and founder and editor of the Free Movement Immigration Law Blog, a popular resource in the UK immigration law sector, which is widely read by lawyers, judges and members of the public. Colin's work covers the full range of immigration law uh, from asylum cases through to EU free movement law, thorny nationality issues and representing high net worth clients and businesses. Colin's forthcoming book, Welcome to Britain, Fixing Our Broken Immigration System will be released, uh, well, this month actually. Uh, all to plan, oh look, there it is. <laughs> um, so uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to Jabir uh, for the first of the presentations. Hello everyone and thank you for giving me this opportunity Libby. I think I need to start with an apology to Ali in particular and, and all of those using BSL to, to listen to this. Um, unfortunately I resort to, to a whole load of numbers in in the presentation and sometimes uh, it can be a bit uh, uh, disconcerting but please stick with me hopefully it'll become clear why I'm doing that. In order to try and improve my presentations I've tried to um, to use music as often as I can in, in, in those presentations and I had planned to to play you Stevie Wonder's Mr Know It All as an opener for for, for this conversation. The reason for for playing that, and unfortunately due to copyright reasons, I'm not I'm not able to. The reason for playing that was that uh, 
I was bullied mercilessly as a child when I arrived in this country at the age of nine. Between nine and 13, uh, I, I can't recall, recount the number of occasions I, I was picked on, bullied, harassed, whatever you like to call it, 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 it happened to me. And the one thing that they all started to do was to, to call me Mr. Knows It All, an attempt to try and focus on features on my face as a way of, of uh, making my life, life difficult. But to be honest, um, I'm quite glad to be called Mr. Know It All. And I was always uh, heartened by listening to Stevie Wonder. And it, it's one of those songs that will stay with me to my, to my dying day because it says so much about what happens to communities if what we do is we we isolate them if what we do is is turn on them in an aggressive manner if what we do is to actually take away opportunities of a free and and, and happy life and I'm, unfortunately much of my presentation is going to present some of that evidence uh, uh, in terms of britain today and what i want to do is to start that presentation if it's okay with all of you what i want to do is talk about personal political and pandemic because i think they're all very closely linked to each other and uh, and to show that what we've experienced in the last four four and a half months and i suspect what we're going to experience for the next couple of years is how those three intermingle with each other and while you would hope that our response to them is going to lead to to people being able to manage the impact of the pandemic i fear the evidence has suggested that actually it's gone the other way it's actually exacerbated people's poor experiences rather than uh, our political action ameliorating those I want to spend a little bit of time looking at some of the pre-COVID-19 data on Britain's black and minority ethnic communities. I then want to look at the data on disproportionate impact of COVID-19 before moving on to some actions that we need to take now. And I would argue that we do need to take them now, not least if we see what's happening in, in, in Leicester. A quick bit of advertising for the Race Equality Foundation um, we've been around since 1987. We became an independent charity in 1995. And we try to use evidence to bring about a change in discrimination and disadvantage experienced by black and minority ethnic communities in, in Britain. And as uh, Liv has already pointed out, we we're, we're work uh, across the country and work with, with many of the organisations that have been impacted or have been at the forefront of dealing with health and care. In this country. Importantly what we've seen in terms of evidence over the last 15 or 20 years is there's an explosion of national data sets that has let us better understand uh, how Britain's black and minority ethnic communities are, de de uh, are uh, faring in this country and that, that growth in analysis has actually provided a, to a degree of comparative analysis as well. So we've been able to look across community, black and minority of the communities and their white counterparts, but we've been also able to look at uh, within black and minority communities as well. However, there's often been the persistence of one dimensional analysis, uh, which has uh, tended not to look at uh, some of the uh, communities within, uh, within uh, my, uh, black and minority of the communities. And it's also sometimes not taken into account some of the socioeconomic characteristics that we might experience. Most importantly, there's very little analysis of minorities within minorities. So black and minority ethnic communities, uh, LGBT people are very rarely uh, um, seen within any of that analysis. Their experiences continue to be hidden, uh, uh, even though there's been this explosion of, of, of data. Other than these, other limitations persist as well, and, and we know that there are some communities that are still uh, not visible uh, through, through much of the data analysis. Most recently, the Gypsy Roman Traveller community. Again, uh, much of the NHS data and Public Health England data that's been released 
they don't appear in there because they're not recorded within the original data sets. However, when, when we start looking at that data, we actually see um, some signs of, of, of some of the successes of that process of migration in, in, in this country. And for me, one of the key is the growth in number of black and minority ethnic people over the age of 55. This is quite a recent phenomenon. Um, while Britain's black and minority ethnic communities continue to be younger than their white counterparts, the reality is that we're also aging now. And we're uh, not only aging, but we're actually, uh, uh, some of us are reaching the ripe old age of 75 and older, which is a significantly new new phenomenon. 75 and older in, in 1991 was less than 9% of, of the over 55 population, whereas now it's nearly 19%. And by 2030, it'll probably be about 40% of, of the older uh, black and minority ethnic population. So that, that uh, longevity uh, is, is playing a part. Importantly, it's not the same across all communities. Uh, the older, commu older people at the moment are mainly from those communities that, that uh, um, sometimes are called the Windrust generation, but are those that migrated in the, from the late 40s to the uh, uh, mid 70s. So it's mainly the Caribbean community, the Indian community, and the more recently Pakistani community. That other group there is mainly uh, groups that have arrived arrived from from the from the Middle East, but I, I would argue that while in a minute I'm going to show you data that suggests poorer health for these groups, it's still a sign of the, some of the successes that 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 have where the migration process in this country has had that we are getting older people from from black and minority ethnic communities. However. The data that we now have had, and certainly the data that Sir Michael Marmot presented in, in February this year, when he was looking at health inequalities, suggests that some of the, that experience is a comparatively poor experience. So if we look at, uh, we've known for a very long time that disabled people in comparison to non-disabled people uh, are more likely to live in poverty and experience that often because of limitations in terms of being able to access employment, but also because of the way some of our benefit system are, are organized. But actually what this chart shows us is that while that pattern is also true of black and minority ethnic people, black and minority ethnic disabled people are comparatively poorer than their non-disabled black colleagues, but also than, than their disabled white colleagues as well. So there, there's a pattern that emerges of, of inequality and, and its persistence for, for these communities. Variation in housing tenure is always an important one because what we've seen certainly since the turn of the century is a dramatic growth in people living in the private rented sector. But for, for the Black Caribbean community, the private rented sector was always a, a, a significant a part of, of, of that, that population and it, it continues to, uh, to, to grow and, and be a part. You'll see right at the bottom white other is also a group that have got a significant uh, number of people living in the private rented sector and that's mainly the newly arrived Polish community that, that's in there. The importance of the private rented sector is that it tends to be the sector with the poorest quality of housing in, in in the country and that's true whether you're living in in London, whether you're living in Manchester, whether you're living in, in York, the data shows consistently poor quality housing. But actually what we've also seen in some work that Nigel de Ronia did for us is that actually the black and minority ethnic groups are more likely to experience housing dep deprivation than, than, than their, their white counterparts. And that's also true of, of those newly arrived communities, uh, uh, particularly from, from Eastern Europe, who are in, uh, experiencing that, that uh, uh, as part of their, their experience. I'm sure many of you will know that uh, housing plays a really key part on people's experience of health and care. 
and it also impacts it's also replicated in terms of people's living arrangements uh, this chart shows us that actually for the majority of black and minority ethnic communities they're more likely to be living in in, in, in deprived circumstances regardless of how their households are formed uh, across the board so when we look at lone parents for example something like 14 percent of of white British uh, lone parents are in uh, housing deprived, whereas for the BME community as a whole, it's something like 24%. And unfortunately, that, that experience of deprivation persists through later life as well, as, as this chart shows that actually, uh, even amongst uh, uh, over 80s, while the difference is something like 6% between uh, black and minority ethnic community and the, the white British counterparts. So yes, we've had a success in that black and minority ethnic people are living older, but they tend to be living in poorer circumstances as well. And unfortunately, the data on, on health in later life is suggesting that actually, um, except for the Chinese community who generally appear to and uh, have a better uh, health in later life. For the majority of other minority communities, it's a poorer experience o o over time. And it's perhaps more so uh, in London than, than, than elsewhere in the country where the biggest part of that population uh, lives. We've always had a difficulty in looking at life expectancy because as a, as a rule, we. Uh, we don't record ethnicity on death certificates and that's come to the fore again with the COVID experience. But there have been various ways of, of, of uh, look, uh, attempts to look at life expectancy, and particularly disability-free life expectancy. And this is a very complicated slide, but what it essentially shows is that for, for the majority of black and minority ethnic communities, their disability-free life expectancy is shorter than their white counterparts, even when their social and economic circumstances are pretty similar, for example, with Indian women, that they, they still tend to have about 4.3 years less disability-free life than, than, than their white counterparts. All this data pulled together has left, led Samarka Marmot to, to come to some conclusions about what's happened as a result of the last, last 10 years of austerity. He suggests that the intersections between socio-economic status, ethnicity and racism has intensified inequalities in health for, for ethnic groups. Some groups, notably individuals identified in gypsy or Irish traveller, and to a lesser extent those identifying as Bangladeshi, Pakistani or Irish, stand out as having poor health across a range of indicators. And his overall conclusion is that from rising child poverty to ignored communities with, with poor conditions and little reason for hope. And these uh, outcomes on the whole are even worse for minority ethnic population uh, groups and, and people with disabilities. And this is the data uh, published in, in February of this year, just before we went into the pandemic. And as we've gone into the pandemic, we've seen more and more data appear on, on the impact of that, that pandemic. Some work, again, Nigel Veronia did for us, looked at uh, the, the data that was published by that time, which is towards the end of April, and show, uh, showed the difference between what would have been expected uh, in terms of uh, the age profiling, in terms of deaths, and what was actually occurring, pointing out that the difference, for example, for the black community was a difference of something like 683 deaths more than would, it would have been expected for, for their age profile. But what's also happened during this period is an attempt to explain away that difference, to suggest that actually that difference can be explained for a range of other reasons. You'll have seen in the last few days, uh, various people argue that it's vitamin D deficiency that is the reason for uh, higher death rates uh, rather than uh, any other explanation. Others have su suggested that it's the experience of deprivation or comorbidities, that is poorer health 
particularly obesity, that's been the reasons for, uh, for um, uh, the poorer outcomes for both the black and minority ethnic communities. Last week, we published a report that looked again at that data and suggested that actually those were unlikely to be the real reasons for this. This chart firstly shows the relative chance of dying following a positive test after accounting for deprivation by ethnic group. And it shows for almost all communities, black and minority communities, that risk was higher than, than for, for their white counterparts. And for some communities, it was significantly so. Importantly, the experience for men as opposed to women was also comparatively poor. And that was true across all, all black and minority ethnic communities. And particularly so for black men and, and Bangladeshi men. Importantly, uh, moving on, the re relative chance of infection was higher as well. So it wasn't just that you were more likely to die, you were more likely to be infected uh, by uh, uh, than, than your, your white counterparts. And again, uh, this is seen as being the result of some of the jobs that black and minority ethnic communities are more likely to do, not only working in health and social care, but also taxi drivers, uh, security guards, people working in, in supermarkets and so on. So the chances of infection are higher for minority ethnic communities than, than their white counterparts as well. And the consequence of this is significantly higher uh, 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 poorer outcomes for, for these com communities when you combine risk of infection and risk of, of, uh, of dying together. And this is true even for those communities who have done relatively well in, the, in terms of the social and economic circumstances, that's the Indian and Chinese communities, they're still more likely to be infected and still more likely to die than, than their white counterparts. And those who then try and explain this by suggesting that actually it's got very little to do with racism, um, we, we need to explain why would it be the case that regardless of deprivation, regardless of, of age, regardless of gender, um, death rates are and infection rates are higher for these communities across the board. I would argue that it, it's inevitably to do with, with the experience of racism and it's inevitably to do uh, with the consequences of some of the data that we already knew. And that's, I think, where I want to, uh, to start coming to a conclusion. None of this data is necessarily new. None of the data that we, we were already sharing by February is necessarily new. But what is shocking is, is the fact that it's not until people have started to die that we've paid very much attention to, to this experience. And I can't help but think that the, that the lack of action, that lack of attention, can only be explained by that experience of racism and the fact that we assume that uh, 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 we don't have to prioritise action uh, uh, around these communities. And we've suggested a range of actions that, that need to be taken and still need to be taken today because the pandemic hasn't gone away. The pandemic is still there and still impacting Britain's black and minority ethnic communities. And we really do need to address that seriously. It is shocking to us that at the end of last week, that's the end of June, we find that the risk assessments of healthcare workers still have not been done. Less than 25% of risk assessments of healthcare workers were done even though this was identified as a priority as early as the 20th of April. This is the biggest employer in Western Europe. It employs 1.3 million people, yet it's, it's found it impossible to do risk assessments when we know that this is a, a significant way of, of um, ameliorating some of the risk people, people face. And the final point I want to make is that actually and a challenge I suspect for the audience is that we need to start writing and documenting this history ourselves. 
because we need to be able to to understand why we've come to be where we are and what we're going to do in the future to make sure that we don't repeat, repeat this experience. To uh, misquote Gil Scott Heron, we don't want it to be his story that records history. We want it to be our story that records history. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jabir, that was brilliant. Um, we're going to just move straight into Colin's uh, section now and then come back for um, a bit of uh, conversation between the two of you in the Q&A. Um, so just before uh, I let Colin begin, just a reminder that we will be taking questions after Colin. Um, so if you'd like to submit those, please use the Q&A feature uh, on the chat. Um, and you can either submit your question anonymously, in which case I'll put it to the speakers, or you can submit with, submit with your name and uh, I can invite you to uh, put your question directly to the speakers. So um, let's hand over to Colin now. Thank you, Jabir. All right, thank you very much, Javi. Let me just get my screen sharing set up. Um, hopefully you will now be able to see that. Um, so what I want to um, talk about really is the infamous now hostile environment, um, a phrase that was um, particularly adopted by Theresa May when she was Home Secretary and um, it has come to kind of typify um, what we know about the Home Office response to migration generally and um, I'm going to um, suggest here that it's had really quite wide, um, significant, um, arguably profound impacts on society and relationships between citizens. Um, and that's really relevant to the way that the Home Office has responded to the coronavirus pandemic, um, because the, the, the response doesn't happen in a, in a vacuum. Um, there's a lot of context, there's a lot of history here. So um, let's get started. Um, I'm, oh, I've got a quick introduction slide there to go through. Um, before I do get started, if you're getting fed up of the slides or, or my face, I, I think you can adjust the, uh, the, the, the screen so that one is bigger or smaller. So um, that, is, that is one of the things you can do, this little bar that you can drag. I was um, experimenting earlier. So um, as Livy said earlier, I've, I've got a book. Was actually, um, the, the, the launch date was brought um, forward, so it's actually available now. Um, which is all about the immigration system and what's wrong with it, what's gone wrong with it over the last 20 years in particular, and with some modest suggestions for how we could start improving things. Um, I've got a background of working with refugees and migrants for the last 20 years. As Livy said at the start, I'm a, a practicing barrister at Garden Court Chambers in London, and I run a website called freemovement.org.uk, and you can also find me on Twitter if you are a Twittery type person. So, the history of hostility. Now, I think some of those who are watching will be familiar with this van. It was um, an example of a van that was driven around areas of London um, with a high proportion of the population who were black and um, ethnic minority. Um, this was back in, I think, 2014, although I, having said that, it might actually have been before that. And um, the idea was that it was going to um, intimidate people into going home. That was the declared intention of, of, of this van being driven around these areas. Whether in fact it was just a political stunt and it was actually aimed at a certain type of voter is, is open, to, uh, open to question. Um, but the, the, the people who approved this um, at the Home Office seemed to be unaware of the, just the huge significance of, of putting go home on the, on the side of a van uh, as a slogan that's got a horrible history to it and was, was used by the, the National Front. It's just a really offensive thing to do and typif typifying really the lack of um, understanding and experience at the senior levels of the Home Office, um, which is you know, hostile to immigration as an institution, I think, um, but also takes its guidance from um, the government of the day and since 2010, um, I, I possibly ought to issue a trigger warning for the for the next slide. It's not a pretty one. Um, since 2010, we've had the the net migration target, 
recently abandoned, to be fair, by, um, by Boris Johnson's government, but introduced by David Cameron um, when he was leader of the opposition, this idea that immigration would be driven down to a, a certain level of below about 100,000. And um, that's a really hard thing to do, it turns out, um, because a lot of immigration is um, family immigration or is asylum or is uh, economic migration of skilled workers or is international students. And you know, none of that is actually, when you start to, uh, start to look at it, undesirable as such. And if you start to squeeze any of those immigration streams or whatever you want to, to call them, um, then there are people who suffer as a consequence of that. You know, families get ripped apart, asylum seekers uh, get treated very badly, um, businesses suffer if skilled workers aren't, aren't available and so on. And that's the, that's the problem that the government caused itself over the last decade. Um, and nevertheless, you know, because of the political significance of the net migration target, it was something that um, the Home Office and ministers felt that they really needed to attempt to achieve or at least be seen to attempt to achieve. And they tried to basically pull um, every lever that was available to them in order to make the UK an unpleasant place to be for migrants. And as we're going to see, um, one of the, the really big problems with all, a lot of the policies that were introduced is that it didn't just make it difficult for migrants, it also made it difficult for black and ethnic minority citizens as well and long-term residents. And that was one of the reasons for um, the Windrush scandal kind of bubbling up to the surface. So one of the um, key sort of um, planks of this policy, I think, and one of the easiest, in theory at least, to, to dismantle are the cost barriers that were created. So um, the, the cost of applying for um, immigration status in the UK can now be an absolute fortune, basically. Um, it, it can be £3,000 for a single application for an adult dependent relative, for example, or for spouse visas over the course of the five years, or even worse, if you're on the 10 year route, um, it can be tens of thousands of pounds for a family of four or something like that if you're on, on skilled migration. For spouses, it's, it's, it's more like sort of eight or 9,000. And the fees go up year on year, so they're very unpredictable as well. Um, been frozen the last couple of years, but we're expecting them probably to go up again in future. So those sort of huge cost barriers um, were intended to um, put people off. But, and this is one of the themes that I'm going to, to come back to over and over again, I think. The thing is that it doesn't put people off coming to the UK, these kind of deterrent policies that we're seeing here. Um, but it does potentially force people into illegality once they're here. So the, the, the measures are unpleasant and they um, target people and make their lives difficult, but they don't make it so difficult that they're forced to leave the country. Um, and you end up, as a consequence, with a lot of people being um, forced into this kind of um, illegal status, um, which is you know, it's not a natural thing, it's a kind of legal construct. Um, and um, that's a significant and it's a, it's a significant growing problem as well. Um, one of the other kind of landmark features of the system over the last 10 years, and to be, to be fair, it goes back further than that, but particularly over the last 10 years, is that it's hideously complex. So immigration law is just, it's a complete nightmare, basically. I can say that uh, as an immigration lawyer. I always feel a bit guilty um, saying it because it sounds like a pitch for business. You know, when you're a lawyer and you're saying, oh, no, it's really complicated, you need my help, that, that, that frankly looks a bit disreputable to me. But um, I think I can say hand on heart that it's, it's really unwise for a lot of people to try and make applications themselves these days because it is so deliberately, um, hideously complex in a way that it simply wasn't. So I've, I've been doing this for around 20 years. And when I started out, you know, most people could have made a spouse visa or a work um, permit visa by themselves, um, application by themselves, but um, that, that's just not really possible anymore. There's all sorts of other things we could go over, uh, indefinite detention and, and you know, cutting appeal fees and waiting times and so on. I'm not, I, I don't want to dwell on those. What I really want to talk about now is citizen on citizen immigration checks, something I've flagged up at the beginning. And for me, this is what I mean by the hostile environment. So I think when people talk about the hostile environment, they often mean in a wide sense, just being unpleasant and nasty to migrants and immigrants. Um, for me, the hostile environment, the sort of defining feature of it um, that really um, was introduced from sort of 2012 onwards, 2014 onwards, especially with the, the Immigration Act 2014, is this um, system of 
quasi identity card checks, but only for certain citizens, only for people who are suspected not to be from round here. And that was aimed at migrants, but black and minority ethnic citizens were caught in that as well. Um, for, for reasons that it, it's sort of difficult to, to go into, but it's not these the checks that introduced in the hostile environment aren't identity checks, they're immigration checks. And basically a lot of businesses and landlords and so on, we'll see in a moment, um, think they only need to carry out immigration checks on people who look like immigrants. And, and that's why you get this kind of element of, of clear racism, race discrimination being introduced. Um, one of the, the big features of the hostile environment, which kind of underpins it all, is data sharing. And you get data sharing between different government departments. And um, that's, again, if a feature like an identity card system. But, um, but it applies only to migrants at the moment. And um, as we're going to see in a moment, this has really profound consequences for migrants because they know that if they fl get flagged up in one context and have contact with um, public authorities or the central government or local government um, in one place, then they get flagged up to the Home Office and it also has an impact on them in, in other areas as well. Um, one important element of this is um, employment and employment checks um, for whether somebody has uh, immigration status go back quite a long time, actually, back to 1996. Um, but the current system of checks was introduced in 2006. It's kind of civil penalty scheme where, where employers will be fined a certain amount. I think it was introduced at £2,000 per um, illegal worker to start with. It soon went up to £5,000, then went up to £10,000 now £20,000 per illegal worker and you know hundreds of businesses are, are fined in this way every quarter. Um, it's enforced through kind of what you might call boots on the ground um, raids by immigration officials. Um, there was a huge ramping up of these enforcement raids around kind of 2012 in particular for, for a few years and there were highly publicised um, raids in um, in, in areas like Brixton, um, those sort of plastered all over Home Office social media channels at the time and so on. Um, and the culture has really changed um, from, from previous years where employers, I think pretty much all now know that they are supposed to check the immigration status of employees. And that was one of the key kind of components um, in the Windrush scandal, I think, because it really um, you know, people lost their jobs. And of course, if you lose your job, then that has all sorts of knock-on consequences about um, how you live your life and where you live your life, your accommodation and, and, and so on. Um, it also applies in other areas, including um, education. So um, schools and colleges and particularly universities have to check the immigration status of their students. When I say schools, I'm really talking about private schools. Um, there is a universal right to education and um, state schools are not supposed to check the immigration status of children. That's not a condition of education. Although there was a time when um, the questionnaire that was sent around every year to parents did ask for nationality data. There was a big fuss about that and the um, Department for Education changed its mind about it eventually. So I think after a year of gathering that nationality data and in fact passing it on to the Home Office, the Freedom of Information record showed that they were passing on nationality information to the Home Office about um, children. Um, then um, that, that, that actually ceased happily. That was one of the rare wins that we've, we've, we've had on the hostile environment. Um, also, landlords now have to check status. So it's a similar scheme to employers. This was introduced from 2014 onwards. And the idea is that landlords are fined £5,000 if they um, rent to somebody who doesn't have immigration status. There's been a lot of fuss about this, rightly so. Um, because it just increases race discrimination in the housing market, essentially. There's a lot of research that suggested that it would do that. Um, they did it anyway. Um, before that, they, the, the whole scheme was piloted and, and David Cameron announced that it was going to be rolled out even before the pilot was finished. Um, and then there's been, since the, the scheme was rolled out, there's been a lot of research done to suggest that it does indeed, as expected, cause race discrimination. Um, so there's, there's been a legal challenge um, They won at the first stage, uh, lost at the second stage, and we're waiting to see what happens now. But um, you know, it, to my mind, it seems, I'm not sure astonishing does, does quite does, does credit to the situation. It's very surprising um, that you've got a government that has in, deliberately introduced a policy that actually increases race discrimination. 
Um, you know, you, you, we can criticize government for a lot of things and um, a lot of things they do right, wrong through ignorance and so on, but to actively introduce a policy like this just seemed absolutely incredible to me. Um, similar system was introduced for banks and building societies and ministers at the time were quite clear that um, if you wanted to, if they wanted to cut down on illegal immigration, as they call it, then um, you need to cut off the money. And so they introduced a scheme where um, banks and building societies would check the immigration status of a, a customer before opening a bank account. That was introduced in 2014. And then incredibly, um, despite there being evidence to suggest that, that, that banks and building societies were getting this wrong, not through any fault of theirs, it should be said, but because of faulty data that was passed to them by the Home Office, um, that was then extended in 2016 so that some bank accounts would actually be closed um, if, if the person was judged by the Home Office not to have status, again, on the basis of data that was faulty. There was a one in 10 um, error rate in the data that the Home Office held and an inspection report showed. Um, that was suspended after the Windrush scandal broke, um, only shortly after it had been introduced. But you know, it, absolutely disastrous to have your bank account closed on you, um, particularly uh, for, for anybody. But um, you, know, you might just imagine that happening um, where you, know, you are actually lawfully resident and the Home Office has just made a mistake. It also happens in policing. Now, I'll, I'll, this is a bit tricky to, to, it's quite surprising, I think, some people that um, policing hasn't really um, particularly been involved with immigration in the past. Um, I've been reading around this a bit and, and it seems that there was a kind of conscious policy decision um, in the sort of late 70s or early 80s that the police would basically not get involved in enforcing immigration laws um, because it was so damaging to community relations. And um, that has changed in, over the last few years. So the police have become more actively involved. There are very few prosecutions for immigration offences, and you know, there are a lot of immigration offences. I can tell you as an immigration lawyer, prosecutions are actually very rare. But what happens now is that the, um, if, if somebody is in contact with the police, they will check their immigration status, report them to the Home Office, and then they get um, detained temporarily by the police and handed over to the Home Office. And that happens to um, criminals, but it also happens to victims of crime as well. And um, there have been some cases of some people who've reported very serious crimes um, who've been held by the police then and handed over to the Home Office and detained, which is just, just astonishing. It does huge damage to, to community relations. Um, perhaps less significantly, but you know, it's, it's still important um, that, that a similar regime was extended to driving. So the DVLA has to check the immigration status of um, people who hold licenses and um, take them away from them if they have no immigration status. Um, something similar introduced also for marriage, and there's, there's been a long-standing duty on marriage registrars, registrars to check the status of those who are getting married, but that was significantly extended in 2014. There was a sort of new mechanism introduced whereby the Home Office could effectively object to a marriage taking place um, if the registrars reported it to them, and that would pause the marriage, it didn't stop it from taking place um, completely, um, although it, the way it works it does actually in some cases, but it would extend the notice period for marriage basically in a lot of cases and there are um, I think around eight or nine thousand of those cases per year now where people have the, a kind of investigation of their immigration status because they've been reported to the Home Office by a marriage registrar. There's also been a lot of third sector involvement. So we've looked at kind of the citizen on citizen checks by employers and landlords, for example. We've looked at um, public authority checks where non you know, people who are associated with government at some level, at least, um, are, are carrying out checks. But also um, charities in the third sector got involved. Um, some were kind of roped in by the Home Office to start getting involved in um, sweeps of um, homeless uh, rough sleepers. Um, and we've also seen that extended to some churches and, and temples and mosques where funding has been offered by the Home Office to assist with um, basically reporting people and assisting them to leave. And then I'll get there in the end, also healthcare. So, um, you know, it's a long-standing principle, goes back to, again, the 1970s, that um, in theory, it's not possible for a foreign visitor to use the NHS. Um, however, it, it took years and years for government to try and 
get serious about that and to introduce um, genuine mechanisms that would cause migrants not to have access to the NHS. And it's really from 2015 onwards that that becomes effective, um, but with pretty dire consequences, which were eminently predictable. And it means that while emergency health care is always available and access to a GP is always available, um, other kinds of treatments aren't. And it often means that a person has to get really, really ill before they qualify for treatment. And if they'd been treated earlier, then they wouldn't have gotten really, really ill in the first place. Um, and in common with other areas of the hostile environment, the legal requirements are often what I would call over-enforced. So the, it's, it's like health and safety laws. People think that health and safety laws prevent them from doing X, Y, and Z, playing conkers or, or whatever. Well, people think that the hostile environment, um, even receptionists, for example, at doctor's surgeries, think that the hostile environment um, requires them not to um, register people who can't prove their immigration status, whereas that's not actually true. Um, so you get this kind of over-enforcement that also cuts off um, key services to people who are in theory um, entitled to them. Now, to be fair, um, the government quite quickly, um, once the coronavirus um, crisis kicked off, made it clear that COVID-19 treatment would be free, um, whether it was emergency health care or not. Um, but that really does nothing to deal with the underlying issues that are caused by all of the different measures that we've looked at. because. Um, people are being discriminated against. I think it's quite clear there's a lot of research now to show that um, the hostile environment increases race discrimination um, against migrants, but also um, black and ethnic minority citizens as well. And I, I, again, I'll repeat the point, that's how the Windrush scandal bubbled to the surface. It was a bunch of people who were long-term lawful residents some of them, I think, were actually British citizens, but a lot of them weren't. They had a status called indefinite leave to remain, but they didn't have the documents to prove it because they'd never been issued with them by the Home Office um, and they'd never needed them before. You know, in, in previous years, employers wouldn't have questioned their right to be here in the UK. And it's only um, really since 2010 um, that this kind of raft of laws and increased enforcement has changed the culture and it means that uh, it, it meant that people were suddenly being challenged for um, their, their immigration status. And some people who were here perfectly lawfully and had been for decades weren't able to prove it. And they, they suffered horrendously um, as a consequence. It also um, it increases fear of the authorities. And that's particularly um, the case with the data sharing stuff I talked about earlier. I touched on this. And that includes health professionals and hospitals because um, migrants know that if they um, approach a hospital and get treatment, approach GP and get registered, that information can and sometimes will be sent to the Home Office and they can be detained and removed at some point in future. So making treatment available isn't actually that much help to people in this situation um, if they're too afraid to, to go and get that treatment. And there have been plenty of anecdotal examples of that, that happening. People who really needed um, treatment and didn't get it, basically. And that's a feature. It's not a bug. You know, that's, that's not an accident. That's a deliberate policy. That's the whole point, really, of the hostile environment. It's to, to force people underground and to deprive them of the basic necessities of life in the United Kingdom. That's the declared aim of the whole policy. So it's, it's no accident. One of the really important side effects of this that the Home Office and ministers simply don't talk about is that it creates a very large, what I call unauthorised population. You'll see, you'll see people talking about this as being an undocumented population. I, I don't use the word undocumented myself because um, that was the problem Windrush people had. They were legal, it's just they didn't have the documents. Um, and you'll hear ministers in particular or, or, or um, people in the press talking about illegal migrants or the illegals. You know, no person um, is illegal as such, their actions may be, but the person isn't. Um, but I, I think it, it's fair to say that this, the, the, this group is unauthorised. They're not, they don't have lawful permission to be here. And this group has been growing significantly over the last few years. Um, for many years, there were no reliable estimates at all uh, at the size of this population. And of course, it's an inherently impossible thing to know because, you know, these, these people aren't 
uh, easily counted. They're not, they don't come forward for, for counting purposes. Um, but there have been a couple of major um, research reports into this recently, uh, one by Pew Research, um, and I think, I, as I understand it, there have been criticisms of the methodology, so I'm not sure how reliable the numbers are, but the upper estimate was an unauthorised population of 1.2 million in the United Kingdom, and that that was actually the highest in Europe. Um, and then there was another research report which was commissioned by the Mayor of London, particularly to look at young people, but it looked at the, the population um, as a whole, um, 215,000 young people under the age of 18 um, found to be resident without, um, without documents. Um, but the, the estimate for the unauthorised population as a whole, including adults, was around, the I think the lower estimate was around 600,000. So I've been talking about a range of 600,000 to 1.2 million, which is a huge range, obviously. But um, you know, it gives you an idea of the scale of the, of the issue. And I say, we, we don't know whether that is... Um, those numbers are really accurate, but um, certainly it's, we're talking about a really significant number of people who are in this position. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that um, people aren't being removed. So I took this um, chart from the most recent Home Office immigration statistics, which were released um, a month or so ago, I think. And this shows you the number of returns in thousands um, plotted against the date the year ended and you can see the the black line is voluntary returns now if the hostile environment were working we would expect that number to be rising but there's no evidence that it is working um, and you would also perhaps be surprised to see that the number of enforced returns has been falling and it's now at its lowest level since 2010 and we're only talking about seven or eight thousand people per year so if you look at the size, potential size of the unauthorised population of 1.2 million, and you look at the number of people who are making voluntary departures or enforced departures, you can see that you know, not much is being done to deal with that population by enforcing their removal or encouraging their removal. Um, and not much is also being done at the other end to legalise their stay either. So this population is just growing and growing. Um, the, the routes to regularisation are really poor, really inadequate. There is what the lawyers like me call the 20-year route. In truth, it's a 30-year route to, to achieve settlement. But you have to show 20 years of residence in the UK, uh, which could be a combination of unlawful or lawful, before you can qualify uh, for lawful status. That puts you then on a 10-year route to settlement. You have to renew that every two and a half years, and it costs you a lot of money in fees to get there. Um, so it, it's an extremely poor way of regularising people. It's very unattainable for most people. And that's why this, this population um, is, is just so big, basically. Um, there's been a lot of um, material that has criticised the Home Office for lack of interest, really, in whether the hostile environment works. Um, and it, it, it raises the question of whether the hostile environment really is about reducing illegal immigration, as the Home Office calls it, or, or has some other ideological purpose um, and there's sorry, no, I, I follow this closely there was a report in 2016 for example from the chief inspector for borders and immigration David Bolt and um, he, he noted at the time that there's the home office just hadn't commissioned any research into whether the hostile environment was actually encouraging people to leave um, similar findings were made by Wendy Williams in the Windrush lessons learned review um, just earlier this year um, again, and she looked at this in, in serious detail about just the lack of interest at the Home Office in even commissioning research. Proposals had been made and they'd simply been um, just, just ignored. So there's just nothing being done. And then there was another National Audit Office report just two weeks ago confirming exactly the same thing. Now that quote I've put there, the right thing to do, that's from the 2016 um, David Bolt report. And he said that um, the Home Office, I'm paraphrasing here, but the Home Office um, seemed to be uninterested essentially in whether the hostile environment worked and the people he spoke to at the Home Office, um, civil servants rather than ministers, said that they thought it didn't really matter if it worked. Ministers would still want it done because they thought it was the right thing to do. Um, and essentially it's about cutting off um, access to uh, the essentials of life in the UK, but it doesn't necessarily have to force people out. It's just about uh, making sure people can't have certain things. Um, and that's really, really irresponsible public policy, to my mind. You know, deliberately, uh, consciously creating, or at least being negligent as to create this huge unauthorised population, 
and giving them, you know, not forcing them out, but giving them also no route to regularization and making their lives miserable, creating this kind of really exploitable, vulnerable group of people who can only get jobs in the uh, sort of shadow economy, can only rent um, really poor standard accommodation from very dodgy landlords, um, only have to live with cash, can't use bank accounts. That, that's just an incredible thing to be doing in this day and age, but that is what the hostile environment does. So we have to think about that when we're looking at the effects of the um, pandemic. You know, this is about, um, that this is the context for, for what's been going on. And if we think about the impact that's having on different group of migrants, so um, migrants who are lawfully resident, they are often um, tied to particular jobs. The renewal of their visas um, depends on achieving certain levels of income. And if they lose their jobs, if their income is reduced below a certain level, below a certain threshold, then they can't renew their visas and they either have to leave or they enter this kind of um, unauthorized population, which is, I say, growing year on year. Um, and, and, and that's one of the impacts of the pandemic. Now, the, um, some of the mitigating um, um, help that's been available from the government has been available to migrants. So, for example, migrant workers can be furloughed. Um, but um, we haven't had any proper assurances from the Home Office that if a worker is furloughed and their income falls below a certain level, that they'll still be able to renew their visa. But if you think about the impact on people who are in the shadow economy, unauthorized migrants who were cash in hand, you know, that economy has essentially shut down overnight because of a lockdown and almost nothing has been done to help them. So um, it must be an absolutely appalling situation that they are now in. Finally, um, I'll, ask, I'll ask what are, or how are migrants valued? And this goes back a lot further, I think, than the, the, the current or, or previous conservative governments from 2010 onwards. Migrants have been valued really from the turn of the century, primarily for their um, economic value. They're treated almost like cattle. They're, 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 they're valued by what they can contribute to the economy. Um, the politicians talk about the brightest and the best. They talk about skilled workers. And um, that's a situation that has led to what we have now, where because migrants are valued in, in these very fiscal, kind of brutal, utilitarian terms, um, if they do lose their income, if they do lose their jobs, they're in a particularly vulnerable position. Um, and um, you know they're 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 in a they're, they're in a very weak position essentially moving forwards. And what I'd like to end with is just say you know is that is that a very good way of of judging the value of migrants? Um, one of the things that I've advocated in the book is for a, a phrase that's quite common in the United States with campaigners, but hasn't really been used in this country so much, is to think instead of migrants as citizens in waiting. Um, because these are migrants who, if, if they come in for asylum, if they come in for family, if they come in for work purposes, they're often here to stay. Um, whether that's lawful or unlawful, they're still here to stay. Um, if they, they're lawful, then eventually they're on the road to citizenship, potentially. If they fall into um, uh, illegality, then they enter this kind of unauthorized population um, who kind of existing in this, this shadow economy. Um, if you know, we saw them as citizens in waiting instead, then a lot of these policies would seem like pretty poor public policy. You know, the fact that these people are here to stay, they're part of our society, um, we should be helping them to um, integrate, we should be helping their families to, to do well for themselves, instead of crippling them with um, sort of double taxation, very high immigration fees, and subjecting them to all of this additional discrimination. So that is what I'm going to end on, and I shall hand back over to Libby. That was great. Thank you so much, Colin. Um, just going to invite back to beer as well um, and bring you both off mute. So, um, yeah, we've now heard both from Colin and Jabir, um, and despite the outrage I think we've seen in the media to some extent and within uh, politics around the disproportionate impact of coronavirus on BME communities, migrants, their families, I think both of you have agreed that this was perhaps entirely predictable. 
um, given the UK's hostile environment policies and the living and working conditions of many of the UK's BME and migrant communities. It's basically brought the inequalities of our society just to greater light. Um, um, is there any, did, did either of you want to sort of just uh, comment upon anything the other has said or are you happy to go into Q&As? You're both good. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. We've got quite a lot of questions coming in. Um, mostly throughout, um, everyone sort of seemed to latch onto the Q&A function during Colin's talk. Um, I'm going to start just um, with a question about, I think directly related to you, Colin. Um, someone's mentioned in the BBC tonight, so they're testing your up-to-date knowledge, it was announced that the government was going ahead with plans to give people in Hong Kong right to live and work in the UK. Um, that's estimated to be upwards of 3 million people. How can this be? Um, and is there an immigration problem in this so, sorry, how can this be if the narrative is that there is too many immigrants in this country? Um, is this a question of some immigrants being better than others? Um, and there was this idea as well of um, welcoming people from Hong Kong being potentially driven by financial benefit and therefore a discriminatory way of um, organising this. Yeah, it, this, is a, this is a complex one because um, the people that we're talking about are British nationals overseas. So um, British nationality law is as, at least as much of a mess as, as British immigration law. And there are actually several different types of British national, but not all of those types of British national have a right to live in the United Kingdom, have a right to live in Britain. And you might think, well, what is the point of having a, a nationality that doesn't actually enable you to live in the country? But it's because of the kind of after effects of the empire and the commonwealth and certain groups of citizens who um, weren't deemed by parliaments to have a sufficiently close connection to the United Kingdom. And so although they were going to acquire no other um, nationality and citizenship, they were allowed to have some sort of token British um, nationality. And um, the, the BNOs is there, they're sometimes known British nationals overseas. And um, this is the group in Hong Kong. Of course, Hong Kong was a British colony. It was handed um, back over to the Chinese, as was um, always the agreement. It was a, a sort of lease arrangement of some sort, bizarrely. And um, there was a certain, it was agreed that um, a certain group would be, as a lot of people, um, would be allowed to retain this kind of token British nationality. Um, and it's a fixed group. It's, a, it's not a nationality that you can now acquire or anybody else can acquire. Nobody else can become a British national overseas. So it's a defined group of about 3 million people. Um, and they, by their nature, tend to be slightly older and they're probably pretty well to do. And this government has taken the view for whatever reason, whether that's mercenary, whether it's out of the goodness of their hearts or whether it's writing some sort of um, imperial wrong that was done to these people because they were they were denied proper British status in the first place. I don't know, I don't know what the motivations are, um, but you know, it, it's hard not to welcome um, an, an, open, um, a, an open invitation to these people to relocate here if they want to, if they have to. Um, the government has done it by, um, by, through immigration law rather than nationality law, which is regrettable. So instead of giving these people a right of abode, the same as the British citizen would have, um, it's basically a charge for a small fortune in immigration fees um, on a five year route to, to acquiring settlement and then ultimately um, British citizenship if that's what they want. Um, but you know, it, it, it's welcome. There are obviously some really serious things going on in Hong Kong. And um, yeah, I, I, I think that's all I've got to say on that one. If I might just add, uh, I agree with everything Colin had said. And if if this comes to fruition it, it is welcome because the the scenes that we can all see in, in Hong Kong are, are pretty ter terrifying to say the least. However, the recent past has shown us that actually there's a distinct gap between what's said and what is actually done. Uh, we just have to look at the experience of Syrian children, what was promised in terms of the, them being allowed into this country. And what has actually happened is, is quite different and I think we are going to have to wait to see what, what actually transpires. Firstly, whether people take up this, this opportunity, but secondly, whether 
in taking up this opportunity we, we actually see it through and and allow people to enter the country in, in, a, in a manner that, that actually gives them an opportunity to settle here. Thank you. Yes. Um, so we've had another question. They're coming in fast. So um, I'm just going to try and plug through a few. Um, again, Colin, I'll probably come to you with this first. Um, someone mentions the government has recently announced some interim immigration policy measures uh, that's been published on the gov.uk website. Does the Home Office have the power to withdraw these concessions whenever they please? And do those changes signal hope for lasting reform in policy? Are they merely a strategic political move? Yeah, I, my, my take on this, I, so these, these kind of interim measures are things like um, allowing people um, who basically extending visas um, through not entirely clear legal mechanisms that I'm, I'm not sure actually work, but, but, but I'll leave that to the side. But it's, yeah, the, the government is basically doing as little as possible in as informal as possible a way as, as, as they can. I think in order to make it um, temporary and not to concede things that they they will then have difficulty um, rowing back on later. So for, I gave an example of a, a concession that was made um, earlier when I talked about the ending of the 2016 Act um, bank account checks. So rather than, in, they, 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 it's still difficult to open a bank account if you're a migrant, but at least bank accounts are no longer being closed down. And when that was announced, it was by, I think it was Sajid Javid, as, as, who was briefly Home Secretary, um, and um, he announced that it was being suspended uh, for a review, which of course is kind of the language that politicians use when they're backing down on something. And we've heard nothing more of it since. I'm not expecting that to be reintroduced. But because it was quite formally done and the regulations themselves were suspended, um, you know, they'd have to actively reintroduce that. Whereas the sort of interim measures that we're seeing announced on a website that's not really properly lawfully being done um, and um, it, it's clearly temporary and I think it's to avoid hostages to fortune essentially. Sorry thank you for that and um, did you want to add anything to bit? Absolutely. No, not on that level, no. Um, we've had a question from someone called Nat. I'm going to see if Nat would like to put this question to you directly. Um, um, Nat, if you raise your hand, see if we can find you. Hmm. Brilliant. Hello, Nat. Hi. Hi, would you like to give us your question? Yeah, this is for Colin. Basically, I struggle with clients who could possibly regularise their status under the 20-year rule. And as you know, many have been forced to work illegally by obtaining illegal documents and working in another person's name. How then are we supposed to support the client to prove the 20-year residency <clears throat> when the client may have to incriminate themselves to prove that they have been here for at least 20 years in order to meet the rules? You might not have an answer. <laughs> but... No, thank you very much for the question. And the, the Home Office doesn't make it easy. You know, they, 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 they're very reluctant to grant applications under the 20 year rule. And this was, you know, people are put to a really high standard of proof, which is essentially impossible because if you've been living illegally for 20 years or even just for a, a period during that 20 year um, time, then by its nature, you know, you, you don't have much proof of that. So if you've been living under the radar, you know, you don't have the kind of bank statements or utility bills or council tax statements or whatever that the Home Office is, is basically insisting on in those cases. And you know, I, I too have had clients who've, who've worked in somebody else's name, classically borrowing somebody's national insurance number or, or, or something like that. Um, and it's, it's just really hard to, to prove those cases. Now, I, I haven't done one of those cases um, since the Windrush scandal broke. I know I'd, I'd done plenty in the past. I don't know if the Home Office has perhaps improved its approach to the standard of proof in those cases. But I, I remember the last one I, I did, it was, um, it was a gentleman from Jamaica who'd been here obviously for 20 years, didn't have proof, but he had good friends and he was a musician and one of them had been keeping all of his um, gig flyers and stuff. Um, 
So, and, and you were able to, we were able to prove that to a judge. Judges take a, a slightly more um, realistic view in my experience, you know, because if, you, if you're in front of a judge, you turn up to court, you've got an actual human being who sees you and sees you as a human being. And also you've got witnesses who can testify on your behalf and be cross-examined and they can do well. Whereas with the Home Office, it's all on the documents and they're just not interested unless you've got a really high standard of proof. In, in my experience, which admittedly predates um, the, the, the Windrush scandal. Thank you. Um, so we've also just got a couple of other questions. Um, I'm going to uh, try to paraphrase a few that are, are similar in nature. So we, we had a comment earlier uh, on, on the lack of reference to unauthorised people in, in Jabir's stats. And I, I think Colin's presentation has somewhat spoken to why that might be and, and how difficult it is to attain data in that field. Um, but people are particularly keen to hear about um, relations between um, the kind of disproportionate impact of um, COVID on BME communities. I know we've spoken a bit about this and you've given some theories, but if you could perhaps highlight a few just for people as takeaways, um, perhaps uh, linked, as you were saying, Colin, to the, the hostile environment policies, um, that would be helpful, I think. We're just getting a few questions with that in mind. Um, so should we go to Jabir first? I think that the evidence is mounting. Uh, our colleagues at Maternity Action have, have clearly highlighted a number of cases where, where pregnant women have, have been reluctant to, to um, uh, approach their doctor and, and to use the maternity services because the fear of, of charging and, and, and the consequences of, of that, which has meant that, that their situation is proven to be very difficult particularly as we've seen that COVID actually has a much more dramatic impact on, on pregnant women than it does on, on other women. And there's a real danger that if you, if you, you, you catch it particularly later in pregnancy, it's, it's not really threatening for your child, for your baby, it's threatening for you as well. So anything that deters you from seeking a help at, uh, from a health professional at the right time is deeply problematic and, and, and should, should be addressed. But I think there's perhaps a, a wider issue at play here as well. Um, uh, your immigration status and your minority status never is never too far apart. Uh, my children, when they did the simple thing of going on a school trip to France, and uh, as the, lots of children up and down the country would do, would have to prove that they were British citizens, even though for the rest of the children in in their class, the simple form that is school required to be filled in um, was okay. Because my children, both their parents, their place of birth is not in, in Britain, they would firstly have to prove that they were actually British citizens so that they could go to France. Yeah. Uh, horrifyingly, they were, uh, on both occasions, they were actually then taken off the coach to, to go and see an immigration officer on the return to Britain as well. And, you, and it, it's the case that this, this thing persists and follows you and it does may, mean that it frames your interaction with, with state agencies. It makes you then think twice about who you approach and how you approach them and what you choose to, to take up and not. And in this kind of health situation, crisis that we're facing, it, it can't but help but be having a de deterrent effect on people actually seeking support at the right time. Thank you. Colin, would you like to talk on that? Oh, you're just muted, Colin. Sorry, I haven't got a lot to add. I, I, just to say that you know, people, are, people are afraid and that is the point of these laws. Um, I, I, saw, I saw something that, that really, really irritated me the other day when um, a, a man called Nick Timothy, who, who may be known to some people who have tuned in, he's, um, he was the uh, advisor to Theresa May and um, he was one of the people who was responsible essentially for the for the hostile environment and he was just casually um, criticizing political opponents of his for um, failing to distinguish between new migrants and um, ethnic minorities who are already residents 
And I just thought, we, have you learned nothing from the Windrush scandal? Have you learned nothing from the impact of the laws that you were partially responsible for introducing? Because the problem is that those, those laws which are apparently um, targeted at migrants often also affect um, black and, and ethnic minority citizens and lawful residents in a way that people like Nick Timothy, Theresa May just didn't seem to, just don't understand, I think. I think. Thank you. We've got uh, one last question I'd like to uh, see from uh, if Ali, Ali, would you like to uh, speak live on it to put it to the speakers? Uh, and then I'd like just, it feels like we've got to a bit of a gloomy point. So I'd like to just end by thinking a bit about what we can do. Um, Ali, if you're there, do you want to raise your hand? If not, I'll, um, I'll put your questions to the panel myself. Okay, Ali's question. Uh, having listened to both the talks, it's so stark and clear how structural racism is being perpetuated by authorities in the UK. How do you see your work in this evidence being able to shape the discourse and decisions of politicians or policy makers to create change here when there seems to be so much resistance to even acknowledging it? Who'd like to take that one on? <laughs> Ali, your, your question goes to the heart of the challenge that we, that we face and certainly organisations like ours face and individuals like me face, which is that for a very long while we've been documenting and clearly identifying how how racism and its impact uh, uh, on, on communities are actually having a detrimental impact, not only on those individuals and their families, but also on the state because of the cost of, of addressing uh, the consequences of, of uh, racism. The, but the reality is, and we've seen it during the pandemic, that the, uh, the state and safe services don't seem to be wanting to address that in a, in a, in a structured way. Undoubtedly, in some places, there is good work going on. Undoubtedly, in some places, uh, it has been better addressed than others. But the reality is that it's not the case across the board. And to, to be honest, the murder of George Floyd has per perhaps done more to, to actually create an environment where change is going to take place than perhaps the organisations like mine, mine have achieved. It's brought to, to fruition that actually people people's action will, will challenge the politicians, will hold them to, to better account. I, I do hope that it's not something that disappears in the next few months as, as some of our memories start to, to fade. But the reality is that George Floyd's murder has had a real and identifiable impact on lots of organisations and certainly lots of politicians now actually wanting to do things that are going to make a difference. And I do hope that not only us, but also people in this seminar are, are, are going to use that opportunity to, to force that change through. Yeah, if, if, if I answer now, it's, um, I think organizations like Jabir's are, are really crucial to this because it takes, I think, achieving change is just really difficult and really complex and it takes lots of different people doing different things to try and try and achieve it. And so some people working perhaps a bit behind the scenes and trying to engage um, those in power and those in authority, uh, as well as people waving placards and, and demonstrating um, and, and pushing a sort of more radical agenda. I think yeah, there's, there's a role for, for, for both. Um, I can tell you one way not to do it. Um, after 20 years as an immigration lawyer, I'm getting pretty disillusioned with doing this case by case because it just that the law is a really hopeless way of trying to deal with these kind of structural um, issues and it's, it's not a good way of achieving achieving any kind of wider wins or wider justice and um, I, I sounds like I'm sort of plug, plugging the book yeah, I've just written a book about this because I you know I, I, I have been getting frustrated by it and it's my attempt to kind of get get people to understand how the system works now um, in the perhaps naive hope that if people see how it actually works then they'll they'll see that that's unacceptable um, and also to make some I, I think fairly sort of moderate um, realistic proposals for um, for change as well um, 
so yeah it, do, it does feel like it does feel for the first time in quite a long time actually i think that it, it, there could be some positive change um the 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 fact that those who are in power came to power campaigning on um you know anti-immigration and sometimes verging on racist um platforms you know thinking of the the brexit vote and the you know the way that turkey was was used as a tool by by certain politicians um who, who are quite prominent um that that's not encouraging but um you know a government the way our parliamentary system works a government with a majority of 80 um can do what it wants essentially and if there is a desire in government to make things better and to change things um then you know that that can happen in current circumstances thank you yeah um i i think i'm afraid we're not going to get time now to answer the few remaining questions but um i wanted to just return to something that personally struck me um which was from jabir's presentation where he talked about who documents this we document this how can we begin to document ourselves um, and and our stories and, and that really struck me also as working in autograph we have an archive you know those are people's stories that they've shared with us and and they are part of the historical record even if it wasn't necessarily created in that way at the time um, so I just yeah for those outside of policy or you know for those on the ground are there any any things you'd like to recommend people just keep records of or um, ways in which to kind of document themselves. I thought it was a really nice idea. Did you have any other thoughts on that, either of you? I've never been much of a diary keeper, but the truth of the matter is that diaries often tend to be some of the most uh, emotive and illustrative of people's daily experiences. Even something as simple as keeping a shopping list in your diary is sometimes so interesting to, to see how that changes over time, particularly during periods of crisis such as this. So if you are able to, I would really encourage people to, to put it down on paper in some form, put it down electronically as well now. Uh, it, it's really important. And some of the photography that, that the autograph have, have curated is, is quite incredible. And hopefully people are also doing that, not just on their smartphones, but in, in ways that other people can also share and see, see that. It's really very important that we, we record our own histories because it, it will be a play a major part or, or in future generations understanding not only what we went through but what we did to make it better. Colin, any thoughts on the legacy of this time and how we can be individually involved in pushing the human rights agenda? <laughs> I'm reluctant to speak after Jabir there because I, I thought that was that was really it was. Important. Should we rewind? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I, I, and Jabir spoke brilliantly there about the, the private. I suppose that there's one one of the things that's changed over the last few years is that there is more appetite amongst mainstream journalists to document injustices in the public sphere as well. And I had in the past always been rather cynical of getting a journalist involved with a case and the potential harm that might do to one of my clients or or something like that. And public exposure can be a really two-edged sword and putting people who are very vulnerable and um, in a dangerous position um, into the public eye can be can be very difficult for them. But since um, you know since basically the, the Brexit referendum journalists have been very interested in running those kinds of stories and it, I think it's been really important in shifting the public narrative, um, which is now much more sympathetic to migration than it was previously. Um, in, in the book, the, the publishers were very unenthusiastic about me, including any charts. Um, and I kind of, I, I stood my ground and, and there were a few that I really wanted to, to put in. I like, I like charts a lot. They, 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 um, they really make a point sometimes. And if you look at the public levels of concern about immigration, they have absolutely nosedived since 2016. Um, and that's partly, I think, because people think that immigration is already under control because of the vote in the referendum or something like that. And nothing's actually changed, but, but that's what people think. Um, partly because of that, that trickle and flood of stories and Windrush and people are much more sympathetic 
to migrants. Um, and yeah, if, if people are experiencing injustice, um, then it, it's worth thinking about whether there might be, it might be worth exploring having that exposed to a wider audience because it does help to shift the narrative. It's just, you know, think carefully before you do something like that, frankly, because as I say, it could be double-edged, but it's, it's only worth thinking about now in a way that I think it wasn't previously. Okay, so some cautious documenting on our parts. <laughs> um, okay, I think with that, it's um, now time to bring this conversation to a close. Um, it's been a really brilliant evening. I'm so grateful to have heard from both of you on these issues um, at, at such a demanding time for both of you. So a huge thank you uh, to Colin and Jabir, um, to everyone joining us, um, to people who put questions in the Q&A, um, and also to Ali, our BSL interpreter, thank you. Um, if you enjoyed tonight's free event, um, I'd like to invite you to consider donating to Autograph to support our work and enable us to continue to host free conversations like the one you heard tonight. Uh, you can do this by visiting our website, it's autograph.org.uk forward slash donate. Uh, we'd also be grateful if you could take five minutes to complete the survey that will be emailed to you um, just to give us your feedback on tonight's event, that would be really appreciated. Uh, as I mentioned, our next event as part of this series, Exploring Human Rights in Light of COVID-19, will be around disability justice, and that will be on the 14th of July. So uh, if you'd like any further information on that, it's available through our website. Um, I do hope to see you then again on Zoom. Uh, thank you and good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ali. <laughs>